This is Lessons of the 60s, and today Lessons of the 60s is going to be interviewing Dale Brown, who was a high school activist in the anti-war movement during the 1970s. My name is Ann Gallivan. I will be the interviewer, and our cameraman is Russell Belcher. Um, and so let's begin the interview with Dale. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dale Brown, what were you doing between 1960 and 1975? Well, I was a student in those years. I was born in 1954, so I was six years old and in second grade in 1960. And I think what we're here to talk about is my high school experience where I, worked at, where I was a full-time high school student at Winston Churchill High School. And most of this, the reason I'm here, the reason I'm wanting to share, is that I was a high school activist almost all the time I wasn't in the classroom when I was working on the anti-war movement, mm -hmm. the movement against the war in Vietnam. Um, how about uh, starting with uh, um, the high school leafleting day that you... Okay. Uh, well, let me start how that whole thing began. Um, at the time, well, I actually started when I was 13. I started, believe it or not, leafleting for Eugene McCarthy. And so I was on, cam I was on canvassing buses and we would go and leaflet. And so consequently, I was always doing, from age 13 on, just various volunteer work, whatever I could come up with that looked interesting and also that I thought would help change the world to be a better place. And I was pretty much to the, what you would call the left. So a woman, I was involved in the anti-war movement, going to demonstrations, probably, I don't remember exactly what, but I suspect working in the office leafleting, doing like clerical things. And I met a woman named Kathy Huntley, and I got invited to this conference. And at the time, most decisions were made in these large assemblies, where people would get together and we would have discussions and make decisions. I was one of the few high school students at this conference, um, but I was from Washington, D.C., and I was with the MOVE, I believe. And I had an idea as I was listening to everybody debate. I saw that their goal was to get as many people as possible to Washington, D.C., and I felt like high school students should be part of it, that we should be organized, that we should come. I was imagining a flyer that said, you know, high school students against the war. And I mentioned that to Kathy. I said, Kathy, I said, um, I think we should do something with high school students. And we chatted, and she goes, Dale, we're going to bring that up under new business. So the next thing I know, towards the end of the meeting, she and I started writing out a resolution and what I thought should be done. I stood up in front of the group. I was very nervous at that point, but I did it. And I said, I think we should have a high school leafleting day. We need to bring together high school students from all over the country. And we need to come together against the war. And they passed it. They cheered. I mean, everybody was enthusiastic. I'm sure there were other high school students there. Uh, but the, the whole group cheered. And my resolution was passed. Now, this would have been about 1971 in your yes. junior year. Is that yes, correct? I'm so you would have sure. been 16 or 17? 16, probably, yeah. Um, I mean, we'd have to, we're going to have to get the dates and the times, you know, later. <laughs> but uh, yes, I was in a junior in high school and um, bought this up. So I came back and I worked at a place called Mo the, we called it the Moob office, and it was on Vermont Avenue. And we started talking about, you know, how we were going to make this real. And so they in basically invited me to work in the office. My basic job was twofold that I remember. Now, I have to tell you, trying to get the details of this is really challenging. But I did two <laughs> things. One was to call high school students who we knew from other parts of the country to get them to bring people to this demonstration. And the other thing, locally, we were going to have a leafleting day. Now, the goal of leafleting day, now let me stop for, well, now let me go on with the goal of leafleting day, but remind, ask me about um, you know, why I felt so strongly about this, you know. The goal of leafleting day was to have people leaflet their high schools and tell people about the demonstration. So high school students would know from all the high schools all over Montgomery County and all the students would come together and demonstrate. The problem was principals really didn't like us to do this. And there was a real challenge in terms of students possibly being suspended, um, breaking the rules, et cetera. So what we did was we got the ACLU to agree ahead of time to defend anybody who got into trouble. So part of my goal, job was, I don't believe I actually contacted the ACLU, but I had to contact everyone in high school. I had to work on the lawyer assignments, making sure that everybody had a certain lawyer. So I did that administrative task as well. 
But the goal was to allow students to peaceably give out leaflets in front of their high school. I believe they had to be off school property. I think there was some rule about that. And let everybody know about this high school leafleting day. And of course, we also did a lot of talking about it and letting people know about it just through word of mouth. At the time, there wasn't social media, but you had to actually give people material or talk to them. So it either spread through someone talking to them or through a actual physical piece of paper. Mm. Now, um, if it's 1971 we're talking about, All which right. we are, that would have been the spring that there were two big demonstrations against the war. The first was the mobilization, right. and the second one a couple of weeks later was May Day. Right. So there was this consciousness in the country among students as well as other people that things were coming to a head. Yes. And I'd like you to talk a little about um, now, uh, getting arrested at Fort Meade. Oh, <laughs> well, that was interesting. What happened was, now when I came back, okay, I told you I bought up this big, um, you know, this resolution. And I immediately called my dad. My dad loved, he helped me. He gave me a lot of mentoring in terms of the politics. I told him what happened. He was really excited. He says, I can't wait to hear more. Um, I'm going to wait up for you. And he was like thrilled. And I was really excited to talk to him about it. So I went to the mobilization office, and Kathy said, Dale, we need your help. Now, I knew about this project. What this project was, was we would go to army bases. And the people who were in the army, who were being trained, who were on the bases, knew nothing, needed to learn a little bit about the anti-war work. So we passed out an anti-war newspaper. These were left in certain places on the bases. And then I, get, I don't know the details, but I assume someone from within the base would pick it out and pass it out. And again, I want to stress to those of you who are listening to this, who are younger and who are so used to social media, that at the time, everything had to be physically looked at on a piece of paper. I know it's hard to imagine, but that is how it was. So consequently, one of the things we had to do was to bring these pieces of paper to Fort Meade and pass them to, the pe to, pass them to be passed to the people who are being trained and who are getting ready to be in the Army. So we went. I, uh, Kathy asked me to go and to help pass out these, these, these leaflets, or these actually they were newspapers. And we went. We, there were, I guess, I don't remember, maybe, six, I think around 12 of us, and I was in a car of four. And we were passing them, putting them at, at their assigned places. I know my, one, the one where I was arrested was like actually under a shrub at a certain point, and we were putting it there. And the MPs caught us. They made us stop. They made us put our hands up, which we did. <laughs> and I'm laughing because it was extremely scary. What was going through <laughs> your mind when that happened? Well, I. What, am I going to be arrested for 20 years? I, I, I mean, am I gonna, what was going to happen? I mean, that, nothing was going through my head. I was dealing with trying to act well while I think, I think what I felt was this sort of cold fear and this determination to act correctly. I believe that's, so I don't think it was words going through my head. I think it was just a, a feeling, a, a fear and a decision to act appropriately. So anyway, they took us to this car and read us our Miranda rights and took us into this room where we basically sat there and waited um, for, for quite a while. Now, I was worried. I was worried for a reason that may seem odd, which is my dad was waiting for me. Now, what's ironic about this is my parents trusted me a lot. They never had curfews. They never worried about me. But the one time, I remember thinking, I cannot believe this. The one time my dad's waiting for me, I'm arrested. I have to tell him. So there was, I asked the policeman very politely, can I please make a phone call? I have to call my dad and tell him that I am um, going to be late. And the policeman said, no, the phone's not working. Well, that's not bad. And I was a little, really nervous. I was worried about my dad more than nervous for myself at that point. And then I saw in a back office someone was making a phone call. So I said, um, excuse me, I see that he's making a phone call. Can I use that phone, please? And um, he kind of frowned at me. I said, I, I said, I think it's my constitutional right to, to make a phone call. Can I please call my dad? And he I didn't say anything, but he put his hand on his billy club and glared at me. And my heart started pounding, and I sat back, didn't do anything, made sure I was sitting straight, waited until we were released, which was, I think, around midnight or 1230 or whatever. So we at that point, I was for some reason being driven home by the police, and um, I said, I need you to come in with me. He said, what? I said, yeah. I said, I, I, we have to tell my dad I was arrested. I said, 
he's not going to believe me. I said, you, you have to come in with me. And they did. Both policemen came in with me. And when my dad saw me come in with the police, he said, um, that he was asleep at that point. It was very late. He was lying. He was asleep on the kitchen table. <laughs> and he woke up. He said, Dad, Dad. And he woke up. And he saw me with the police. And I'll never forget his words. He said, thank God you were arrested. You were just arrested. Thank God. I was afraid you were dead. Thank God. And he just looked really happy to see me. And then he looked at my policeman and said, what happened? And they said, well, your daughter was uh, caught illegally passing around leaflets on government property, blah, blah, blah. And my dad said, well, um, he said something I don't remember. He basically said, I think she had the right to be on government property. The policeman left me, and my father and I were together. So <laughs> that was the story. <laughs> okay, we've talked about then your arrest at Fort Meade. You're building up a record here by now. Yeah, I know. And you had a, you had a successful leafleting day at all the high schools, which yeah. was April 19th. Um, the next thing was that there was a bunch of parents that brought an injunction oh, against you. That's something else that happened. Yeah. One thing I want to say about the high school leafleting day locally is that it was absolutely without incident. I mean, apparently our ACLU attorneys worked. Um, the principals did not do anything at all negative. It just went very smoothly. Everybody got their leaflets. We had a good high school showing. So I just wanted that to, to be known. But this is what happened with that. Now there was a, a program. Now I did, I had been involved in something called COAC. This is not particularly activist. It was called Conference on American Civilization or something, where we basically had a day on a Saturday where all the students came in and learned things that students wanted to learn. This was a career day that was being held by Perry High School. And I was asked to give a talk about the anti-war movement. And the idea was I was going to just discuss different things that they could do, I guess, against war. I was going to just talk about the opportunities available for high school students as activists. And that was part of the career day. And the Student Mobilization Committee asked me to be the speaker, and I agreed. And everything seemed to be going smoothly until the morning, I think it was the night before, when Kathy Huntley called me and she says, Dale, there's been a glitch. An injunction is being bought against your speaking. I said, why? Well, it turns out there was this principal. I think his name was Dr. Dunn. Now, Dr. Dunn was a well-known conservative principal. And the main thing he was known for, actually, was that he paddled students occasionally. He believed that paddling would help the school discipline or something. And he and a group of parents had decided that they did not want me to speak. And they bought an injunction against me. And Kathy said to me, you know, if you speak, you will be, um, she didn't say arrested, but the police would be escorting me off of school property, that I was risking arrest, that I was trespassing because of this injunction. And she said, you know, you don't have to do it, but we kind of wish you would. Because, she explained, as a high school student and as a person who was supposed to give the speech, she said, it would be a, be a lot better than if one of them, which she was willing to do, would substitute for me and give the speech and then possibly whatever. Well, it was a big decision for me. Basically, this was a situation. The timing of this thing happened to be during final exams. And if I had been arrested and, you know, was out for these exams, I had the potential of an unexcused absence, because, of course, being arrested was not an excused absence. Um, I, my grades were not that good. They were pretty average. And if I was missing these exams and then got E's, it, it could have meant possibly getting such a low average that I'd have trouble going to college. Um, it was obviously a potential disgrace for me and my family. But the problem was I really felt we needed to speak. I really believed that I had a right to give that speech, that they should not be bullying me into not speaking. And I thought about it a lot. I went back and forth. Um, Interestingly enough, I considered consulting with my parents. I decided it was my decision. I didn't want to involve them. It was a coming of age moment for me. And I decided I was going to give the talk. So I went to Perry, stood at the doorway, ready to give my speech. And the next thing I know, a policeman comes up to me and says, we're looking for someone named Dale Brown. And I said, I am Dale Brown. And he said, miss, um, I didn't know you were a female. He said, but we're going to have to escort you off school property. And two policemen, one on my left and one on my right, started marching me down the hall. 
And then the next thing I know, reporters come forward. And I said, and I had planned this out, I said, this is a violation of my First Amendment right of free speech. However, um, I am going to leave campus peaceably under the circumstances because I have two policemen here, but I believe I have the right to give a speech. Something along those lines. I don't remember the exact words, obviously. And they took me off campus. And then there was, um, the cameras were much bigger then, by the way. Huge camera. They interviewed me on TV, asked me why I was doing this. Um, I was written up in a couple of the newspapers. And then that was it. The ACLU defended me. And what happened was we won, basically. We won the, 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 the entire case because, in fact, there was no way that they should have arrested me and not allowed me to speak. It was a clear violation of the First Amendment. The problem was it took place during summer vacation. And the whole thing was over. And in fact, nobody could hear me speak. So that's that basic story. What I was told by the people at the Student Mobilization Committee was that even though we did not win the case and I could not give my talk, we did win because the court of in the, what they called the court of public opinion. I was, we got a lot of publicity and most people, interestingly enough, really believed I should speak. I heard that from many people. Even one person who was very pro-war, he was planning to enlist. And he said to me, I totally disagree with you. I think you are absolutely wrong. But if you spoke, then I could talk back and disagree with you. If you can't speak, we don't even have a conversation. And again, I don't know whether those are the exact words, but he basically felt very strongly, even though he was planning to enlist. I think he was in, R not ROTC at that point, but he was definitely planning to enlist and definitely was going to Vietnam and disagreed with me completely and wanted me to be able to speak. And that was a general feeling in the community. Um, I, I actually never heard directly from anyone, but there's parents and mm -hmm. I guess Dr. Dunn I never met. So, <laughs> Well, the whole thing got a lot of media, it local did. media, and so that was the court in which you won, the yes. court of public opinion. And yeah. years after, people would, would tell me, you know, that really? they saw me on TV and that they agreed with what I did. So, Now, did you continue your activism into your college years? Yes. I continued my activism into my college years. I um, organized a couple of canvassing buses at Antioch. Mostly, now my college is my first year I was at Pitzer. My next three years I was at Antioch in Ohio. So now I had to, the problem of not, I mean, in Washington, D.C., it was kind of a luxury. I mean, we just got wet. I mean, I took a bus to the mall yeah. and would march. Yeah. And I yeah. got to go to all of these things simply because I lived here and was a bus ride away. Once I was in college, I was far away. And so then the whole problem was um, basically raising the money to get the buses to come to get us to the anti-war demonstrations. And I'll tell you one little story about that, which is we baked cookies at Antioch to raise the money. <laughs> we got someone who, uh, one of our, I worked with the union in the cafeteria, and we got a recipe. And we baked, and we got access, I don't know whether it was legal or not, but we did get access to the kitchens. And we baked these hot cookies, and we would sell them to the students, and that was how we raised our, our money in Antioch. I was not as much a leader at Antioch. I mean, there, and the MOB office, just because I was there, just because I was a high school student, I was actually organizing at a fairly large scale, but I definitely, definitely was against the war, and I continued that through college. Now, one of the things that you said in the little um, paper that you, mm -hmm. that, you, that you sent us was that you said, I, I was part of a big, huge movement which was changing the country for the better, and you expressed real satisfaction in feeling that. I did. I uh, felt it. Here's what I feel, and it's frustrating because I've always wanted that feeling back. In the anti-war movement, we were all working together, and there was a certain closeness that, that seemed to always be there. And what I felt was that we were all pulling our weight, we were all working hard, we all helped each other. Um, there were just a number of incidents where, you know, something would go wrong with somebody, we would go and we would help them. So we were always practically helping people. And it was even just a, a feeling that, you know, if I had really been arrested, if I had, you know, been unable to go to college, I felt like people would kind of pick me up, help me a little bit. And I felt that partially because I was helping people pick it, picking people up. Right. I was helping people to, in, in the different things that went wrong for them. So it was a hard movement but it was definitely worthwhile. And, and 
and beautiful. Um, I'll give, look, can I tell one other story, which I, yes. I just, which was amazing and very interesting, which is one of the things I would sometimes do is I would um, watch the office because they were all part of this committee, which I believe was a Socialist Workers Party. I'd actually like to learn more, but they were part of a group that would often meet and I wasn't part of it. So one day they asked me to watch the office while they, they had their meeting. And so I'm sitting in the office and this telephone repairman came in. And he said, can I repair the phone? And I said, of course, let him repair the phone. So I thought, <laughs> then he left. And then someone, when they came back, they said, what happened? And I told them, I said, someone came in to repair the phone. And his mouth went open and he said, oh, we should have told you. Turns out it was a phone tap they put on the phone. Right. And they showed it to me. They took the phone thing off and pointed to it. And um, obviously I shouldn't have let them in. Obviously they should have warned me not to let telephone repair people in. But what I think was kind of cool was he didn't blame me for letting the telephone repairman in. He said, oh, we should have told you. So there was a way in which we all kind of took responsibility for our part mm -hmm. that I don't find as true in the rest of the world. I mean, I know that if something like that had happened to me when I was in the workplace, I would have immediately been told, you shouldn't have let them in. Yeah. You know, so that really was a good sense of community, hard work, and, and us all being in together. Well, the, now the last thing I want to ask you is, um, Dale, is that how did the experiences of being a high school activist and a college activist impact the rest of your life? Well, first of all, I, I realized that I really loved activism. I liked changing things and that I just realized that, I think what I realized as a result of the anti-war movement is that you really could get in there and change something. And I think that's a lesson that most of us who were active in the 60s had, is that we got in there and we really did change things. Um, there's a lot written about the greatest generation, and I believe they were great to win World War II, but what people forget about is that the world we grew up in was very sexist, very racist, um, it, was a, it was a world where you did well if you could conform to a very narrow band. If you could conform to that narrow band, then things went really well for you. But if you couldn't, it was a really hard world. And so we changed that, all of us, together, in different ways. I wasn't working very hard on anti-sexism. I wasn't working in the women's movement. But I knew that people were, and it made a huge difference. So what happened, after I graduated college, I discovered that I had learning disabilities. And I discovered that there were challenges because of that. And I felt like I wanted to change things for people with learning disabilities. And I did. I joined a group called Time Out to Enjoy that then started organizing a group called National Network of Learning Disabled Adults. And that's a whole other story. The fact of the matter is that my work and the work of the team that I worked with ended up making things a lot better and a lot different for people who have learning disabilities. For one thing, Americans with Disabilities Act passed. Um, the National Joint Committee on Learning Disabilities made a lot of statements about learning disabled adults. They understood that people with learning disabilities had certain issues that were not known before the learning disabled adults got involved. And so I, that became my career. I became active in that, and then I joined the government. So, you know, as a civil servant, and did that for 25 years, actually. I worked for the President's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities. So I feel that my experience as an anti-war activist taught me that I could make changes, and it taught me that we could make changes, and it taught me that we could join together and make something happen. And that has changed my whole life because I was able to make something else happen that was pretty big, and yeah, I feel hopeful I can make other big things happen. So it was a wonderful thing. Thank you, Dale. You're welcome. Okay, when I completed uh, the work I was talking about when I went to the meeting and I brought up the resolution to bring High School Leafleting Day to reality, one of the first things that we did when I came back to the office was a press release. And this press release basically says that the Leafleting Day is going to happen on April, for the April 24th event, and that it's going to be on April 19th. 
Um, you can also see that Kathy Huntley was the main person who was the student mobilization person who worked on it. And uh, we put this out. Should I read it? Uh, maybe. Leaflets advertising the April 24th mass anti-war demonstration in Washington, D.C. will be distributed at every high school in the D.C. metropolitan area on April 19th. The major purpose of this leafleting campaign, sponsored by the Student Mobilization Committee, and that was the Student Mobilization Committee to end the war in Southeast Asia, is to prove that high school students have the constitutional right under the First Amendment to distribute flyers at their school. Legal aid is being organized in case of suspensions, expulsions, and other harassments by principals and administrators. The Student Mobilization Committee is working to form a network of communication and cooperation between students. To coordinate this and future projects, the Student Mobilization Committee has established a high school desk to serve as a central communication point. Students wishing to help with either project should phone Kathy Huntley or Dale Brown, and the phone numbers are there. And um, one of the things that this, um, reminded me of is that this was a strong speech, free speech project. We really wanted high school students to have the right to speak, to say what they needed to say. And in this case, what we, wanted, what we were saying was, come to this demonstration that's against the war. And we did have every high school, if I remember properly. And as I said earlier, it went very peaceably. We got ACLU attorneys to help. We had one assigned to every student, and the principals did not do anything. The other thing is we had to have a flyer for ourselves. And I designed this. Um, now at the time, design was not done by computer. I actually had to cut all this and paste all this and Xerox it all. But this is the flyer that was given out at um, a number of the high schools, particularly mine. And as you can see, it advertises both the April 24th and the draft and the war and the May 5th um, demonstration. And one of the things that I said, and I'm going to go ahead and read this, is are high school students affected by the war? Some people feel this classroom is far away from the rice paddies of Indochina. If you agree with them, answer these questions. Are you in danger of being drafted? Student deferments may soon be halted. If you do not end this war, you may end up fighting in it. And um, every 36 hours, the U.S. spends 125,000 in, in 125 million, excuse me, in Indochina, the entire school budget for a year. Do 30 students fight over 15 microscopes in your lab? And that actually was in my high school, by the way. Are students, uh, are science experiments delayed because of lack of chemicals? The money that should have bought your chemicals is buying napalm and defoliant. Are you paying, paying more these days for school supplies and lunches? Inflation is the price of war. Yes, as high school students, the war does affect you. But the South Vietnamese teenagers do not have the dubious privilege of being students. They must be shoulders. And so we had a high school student, and we said, meet at the contingent, meet at the ellipse at 11 AM, and march down Pennsylvania Avenue. OK, and then third one, I don't have quite as much to say, but this was a high school bill of rights that I was part of, part of but not, this was not my major thing. And basically, we felt the problem with being a uh, young a person under 18 is in this country you basically don't have a lot of rights I mean your parents can do whatever they want with you to a certain extent and we felt there should be a bill of rights that would help high school students to be able to have some autonomy and some freedom and also you know part of it was just being able to participate in these activities and not being told or well, you're grounded you know you can't go you know or well you know, if, if you do this, you're going to be suspended, and you know, then your whole future is going to be screwed up. Any last words? Well, basically, that we were trying to end the war. We were trying to change the country to be less sexist, less racist, more equal, and that was our goal. I mean, we were not doing the right to get drunk or the right to, I mean, even the right to smoke pot, we want, we, some people did smoke pot, I actually didn't, 
But what I'm trying to say is that we were really fighting for a country to be better, to be more of an equal and free and wonderful country that we were raised to be. We were inspired by Patrick Henry, by Thomas Jefferson, by a lot of the founding fathers, and by the fact that we, the country was founded by a revolutionary war. And this was our war, ironically, against the war. So actually, we didn't see it as a war. We saw it as a peaceful effort. But we were trying to make the country better. And we succeeded.